Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Especially to our guests and visitors today. This is the seventh Sunday after Trinity, and the order of service will be following this divine service setting. Three is printed in the entire day in your bulletin, in the hymnals on page 184. Uh, the opening hymn is 616, Baptismal Waters Cover Me. Son, Jesus. 
Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Wise and go together and sing in the influence.
O God, whose never-failing providence orders all things both in heaven and earth, we humbly implore you to put away from us all hurtful things, and to give us those things that are profitable for us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. reading for the seventh Sunday after Trinity is from Genesis chapter 2. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the gardens, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of the, that land is good. Delium and Onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the third is the river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria, and the fourth is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're trying to sing the song for this day, Psalm 33, verses 1 through 11. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Romans chapter 6. For 
Paul writes, I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Rise from the Alleluia. because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, How can we feed, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they set them before the crowd, and they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
Please rise. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text of our meditation today is our gospel reading from Mark 8. In those days when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd, because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples asked him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full, and there were about 4,000 people, and they sent them away. This is our text. Let me see. Dear Christian friends, Oh, we had a beautiful hymn this day. I want to reread verses 3 and 4. We sought the Lord in our distress, O God, in mercy, hear us. Our Savior saw our helplessness and came with peace to cheer us. For this we thank and praise the Lord, who is by one and all adored, to God all praise and glory. He never shall forsake his flock, his chosen generation. He is their refuge and their rock, their peace and their salvation. As with a mother's tender hand, he leads his own, his chosen band. To God, our praise and glory. We do trust and have a great blessing in God, in Jesus Christ. Jesus came to be our Savior. He came to die and rise again and ultimately put us on a track to eternity, to be raised again on the last day when he will come back and this world will be destroyed and recreated and we will live with forever with God in a new heavens and a new earth. But in the meantime, we live in this world. And what about this time? Where does that leave us now, before Christ comes again? What, what, is there any difference in what we Christians experience versus other, other people? I mean, we do seem to have troubles. Christians still suffer. They have illnesses and even die. In fact, it is predicted that this would be so. Paul, as he was visiting churches that he had started in Acts 14, was encouraging and strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Through many tribulations. Is that that's good news? Well, yes, it is. We need to understand that, I think, in a right way. And this past year has been an excellent test of that. In fact, the struggles of this past year inspired Harold Sankwile to write a book called Christ and Calamity, Grace and Gratitude in the Darkest Valley, exploring the issues that we face when we experience the difficulties that we do, and seeing that in them, most of all, they are, there's opportunities for us to connect with and know God and Jesus Christ more firmly, to know that He is still that he is with us. St. Paul writes, calamities come in different sizes. Sometimes they are comparatively minor, not much more than minor inconveniences when you get right down to it. But other calamities are serious disruptions or overwhelming tragedies. But one thing about calamities, large or small, they get your attention. They lead you to think about God for a change. As C.S. Lewis wrote long ago, pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Um, this time we are, the, the things that we experience now in this life, from Jesus' ascension to his return, even with all the problems that we face, all the sin and struggles that we have, it is still a time, uh, God teaches us in the New Testament, a time of Jesus Christ ruling and reigning over this world. That is something that, of course, needs to be held on to by faith. It's sometimes not easy to believe. Even though we know that this world is not as we know it should be and are also confident will be again, we can have a taste of that future world in this life. I mean, this life is not all um, complete lack of God. We look forward to the joy of eternity, and we even taste that joy 
in this life. Again, St. Paul writes, the writer of the letter to Hebrews frames Christian suffering with joy. Hebrews 12 begins with these words, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Having finished his race with triumph, Jesus achieved the goal of his entire life and ministry to pay the penalty for our sin and to ransom humanity from the clutches of sin, death, and hell. We too can find joy in suffering, provided it is wrapped in the suffering of Jesus. This is what our sufferings do. They connect us, they remind us to out of and connect us to Jesus, our Savior. This morning, the readings did that point us in that direction from the description of the, the pre-fall and pre-sin world that we heard in Genesis chapter 2, to the confidence that in baptism we have been set free from sin and gained the free gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ in Romans 6, to this miracle, the miracle of the feeding of the 4,000 in Mark chapter 8. In that miracle we see Jesus coming to our world, to a world that was changed and damaged by sin and beginning, in a sense, to restore what sinful human beings had broken. Jesus had compassion. He had compassion on the people, on the crowd that came to him. He was there with them. In this world facing what we do, it makes all the difference in the world to have Jesus with us. Jesus who has compassion on us. That crowd there had needs that Jesus was fulfilling. And he directed his disciples, his disciples to do to that need. He called their attention to it because he wanted them to do something about it. See, this is another reason why we are left in this world, to see the needs around us, to see the needs that people have and to, and to do things about them, to be followers of Jesus and in that way to absorb Jesus' own compassion for people and to desire to actually do things to help. It's amazing when you look at the bigger context of the Gospel of Mark to what the disciples had to ask this question. How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? It's an amazing question because not too long before, Jesus had, they had faced a similar situation where 5,000 were with Jesus and Jesus had at that time multiplied the loaves to feed people. You would think the disciples would have gotten the picture and, and asked Jesus to do the same thing again. But the disciples needed to learn again that lessons of reliance on Jesus Christ for all their needs. I suppose it's a picture of us too, because so often in our needs we fail to remember how many times in the past God has, through Jesus Christ, helped us as well. And if Jesus has helped us, he can also help others. This is how we help other people with their needs in this world. We notice needs, how do we respond? Well, I mean, you know, the, the needs of people around us seem so overwhelming at times. It seems like we're in a desolate place with no help around. But we do know the answer. We should know it as Christians. And that is by bringing people's need to Jesus in prayer and bringing Jesus to people. Paul, when he wrote his second letter to the Corinthians, began with these words. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation, and if we are comforted, it is for your comfort which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. St. Bile uh, again comments, but remember, comfort isn't necessarily comfortable. Finding comfort doesn't always mean we are released from suffering. Instead, it means we are not alone. 
in our personal misery or pain. We have company when we hurt. That's what a comforter is in the New Testament. Someone call alongside us to sustain us in calamity. As Christians, the best we can give each other in times of affliction is what we ourselves have received. Comfort from the comforter-in-chief, Jesus Christ, our Lord. <laughs> Jesus is with us, and so we also, when we meet people in need, we can be with them in their need and bring them also Jesus to be their comforter. Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, came into this world, this forsaken place, made forsaken by sin, but he came himself to save us, and also where he, it is also this world, is where he leaves us for a time, for these purposes, to grow in faith, to recognize God's own presence with us, and to learn from that, but also to help other people. This is the unique Christian message. In the Gospel reading, we see Jesus in the wilderness with a multitude of people who have nothing to eat, those who are feeling the effects of the curse of sin very concretely. It is much like where we are today, where we live. And yet Christ took on human flesh and blood and put himself smack dab into that place, into the middle of this fallen world in order to rescue us and raise us up. Adam sinned turn this world from the paradise that we saw in the first reading in Genesis 2 to a bleak and harsh place. But Jesus came into this bleakness and harshness as a true human being to undo that curse on creation and restore paradise. Jesus said his words to his disciples in the gospel were, I have compassion on the crowd. Jesus has compassion. He empathizes with us and feels for us in such a way that he made his prob our problems his problem. Not only the spiritual, but also the physical needs of those people. He didn't want them to faint on their way home. Jesus feels for what happens to us, to you, to your physical bodies. He knows what you're going through. In his great mercy, he came to suffer with you and to suffer for you in order ultimately to take your suffering away. This morning we prayed in the colic, give us those things that are profitable for us. That's what God does for us in Jesus. And we begin to see that taking place already in this miracle of the feeding of the 4,000. Jesus, who is the second Adam, begins to reverse that curse of the fall, producing bread in abundance for these people without sweat or tiring labor. He begins to restore the bounty of the Garden of Eden, where food was given freely and received in overflowing measure from the gracious hand of God. Jesus is beginning to do that for us, even in this world. It is a small glimpse, both of how it was at the beginning, but also how it will be, how it will be for us in the new creation, in the age to come. Of course, we are still, still in this world, a world where we see and even experience suffering, hardship, and tribulations. Why is that? We'd like to know more clearly the answers to that question. Well, we don't know all the answers. Well, we know that, that, that those sufferings, those hardships that we face are opportunities. Opportunities to grow in trusting God and opportunities to grow in serving others. With Jesus, there is also a taste of joy and a promise of joy to come. Jesus had compassion and he still does. He rules this world and leads us in this world for a time, again, so we can help. In Christ and through Christ, we pray and we receive. Put away from us all hurtful things and give us those things that are profitable for us. And God answers that prayer. He does provide for our needs. We should look back and see how God has helped us in the past and, and continue to pray in our need and know that God answers that prayer because in Jesus we are blessed. He does provide what we need. He does care for us. And we can take joy in that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise. And may the peace of God which passes all our human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Join together in singing the offertory, Create in Me.
fellowship pads in the center aisle side of each pew and fill those out, pass them to the outside, and then returning them back. God, our King over all the earth, reigning over the nations, sitting on your holy throne, graciously receive our prayers and praises. Subdue the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh under the feet of your people, that we may share in the victory that Christ has won for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the earth, our Savior, multiplied bread and fish and fed over 4,000 people in Gentile territory, thereby showing your kingdom is open to all nations. Bless and protect the work of our missionaries in this country and around the world, that all people would receive the bread of everlasting life given us in the word and sacraments of Christ. Raise up workers for your church and be with those preparing to serve. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Creator and preserver of all things, you govern and sustain the earth for our good and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Bless the labor of those who produce food and shelter, safety and peace especially for those in need. Lead us to recognize your gracious hand in all things and to receive our daily bread with thanksgiving. Be with our elected leaders and with our military men and women, especially Mike Carl, Benjamin Halverson, Jason Halverson, Zach Halverson, Eric Jazerski, John Jazerski, Eric Johnson, David Pulsey, and Nick Pulsey, and those in basic training, including Jacob Frank. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord and giver of life, you formed us from the dust of earth and breathed into us your own breath of life. All people are made in your image and have dignity and worth in your sight. Defend your gift of earthly life at every age, from natural conception to natural death, and grant all mankind to live in peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear you I forever. Grant your continued blessings, O Lord, to your servant Jim Frank, to whom you have granted 80 years of life in this present life. May you continue to know your loving kindness, abide in the confession of your care and protection, and in all things give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, most graciously, regard all those for whom we pray, especially Jane Antonson, Joanne Bowman, John Buckles, Bill Carey, Drew Chambers, Doug Chambers, Chris Urban, Evelyn Frazier, Matthew Gibson, Bill Coivisto, Tim Jazerski, Pat Johnson, Teresa Coimula, Eileen McKenzie, Diana Miller, Margaret Nielsen, Delilah Olson, Julie Reinemann, Wyatt Robison, Ray and Virginia Rodenwald, Dagmar Siebold, Dave Sorensen, Jess Ronan, Kay Tentari, Arm Wedward, Tim Wendy and Ashley Beard, Doug and Nancy Egbert, Lou Johnson, Katie, Carrie Jones, Lois, Greg and Marla Maddock, Deborah McKeever, Thomas Murphy, Carl Norman, Sarah Ochard, Ramona Sanders, Jeff Stevenson, Adeline Silliman, Katie Ward, 
Dan Spielman, Wallace Rock, Jihan Udall, and Elizabeth Newmark. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of grace, as your son fed thousands in the wilderness by multiplying bread and fish, feed your people gathered here today with the true bread from heaven, the body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ, that even in the wilderness of this world we may share in the eternal life of paradise. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need. Grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever. Amen. The Lord be with you.